Good evening and best wishes for a much happier and healthier 2021. I'm Kate Ford, it's 5.31 and I'm calling to order this special meeting of the Santa Barbara Unified School Board. And as we have for the past many months, this meeting is being conducted on Zoom. And now for information and directions about interpretation of this meeting. Thank you, Board President Ford. I will give this announcement in both English and Spanish. It's an announcement with regards to language interpretation. A good evening. In order to provide language access, we will be providing simultaneous bi-directional interpretation in English and Spanish. If you are bilingual, you do not have to click anything. If you are not bilingual in English and Spanish, you will have to select your language in order to hear the interpretation. If you are on a laptop or desktop, at the bottom right of your screen, you will see a globe icon that says interpretation. Please click on the globe now and select English. If you are on an iPad or a phone, locate the three dot menu and select language interpretation. Then select English and click done. When it's your turn to speak, please remember to be loud and clear. Thank you. And with regards to American Sign Language interpretation, we are offering American Sign Language interpretation for this meeting. If you will be using ASL interpretation, please use the Zoom app on your computer, tablet, or phone to join this meeting. If you joined this meeting through your web browser, you may not be able to see the ASL interpreter at all times. Are there any questions with regards to interpretation? If there are none, then I will ask the host to please assign me as an interpreter and we may begin. Thank you. Thank you. I am so very glad that we've added American Sign Language to our interpretation of board meetings. And I want to thank Ms. Jacqueline Jimenez who reminded us of the importance of doing so. Ms. Maldonado, will you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Absolutely. Please put your right hand over your heart. And I know that we'll show the flag in a minute. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. As we begin this meeting tonight, on behalf of the school board, I want to express our deepest condolences and sympathy to the family and friends of the two young men, Omar Montiel Hernandez and Angel Castillo, who lost their lives on Sunday evening here in Santa Barbara. As a member of the public, I, I don't know much more about this heartbreaking tragedy, but any time that a young life is cut short, it is a strong reminder, a mandate, that we as a community must do whatever we can to ensure the safety of every young person. So to honor the lives of Omar and Angel, please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. And with that, I turn this meeting over to Ms. Maldonado for her superintendent's report. Thank you, Board President Ford. Good afternoon, board members and viewers joining us tonight. I would like to begin tonight's meeting by acknowledging the fear, pain, and loss that many in our community, our state, and our country are experiencing as a result of the surge in COVID-19 rates along with, of course, this new strain that has recently been identified and the rate of infections sweeping through our communities. Of course, our much too young lives that have been lost. President-elect Biden recently stated that the jobs report shows that we remain in the midst of one of the worst economic and job crises in modern, in modern history. I wanna thank you board members tonight uh, as we continue our journey with you. As with all things COVID, we come with some ready answers and anticipate that we will also have more questions than answers, but we know that in the days to come, there will be more clarity as we continue to receive updates from our state and local health departments, 
on new guidance by the governor on school reopening, testing, and vaccinations. The two main topics for tonight are the new governor's guidance on preparation for reopening schools and our continued conversation with all of you and our staff on the issues of student outcomes and specifically our grading policy. As it has been with the recent board meetings, it, it is to update and seek the board's guidance and on the most current issues we face as a result of the pandemic conditions that we are operating under. This, this recent announcement by the governor reminded us that in, order, in addition to having safety as our primary lever, we must continue around the issue of the academics achievement of our students, which is the key purpose of schooling. And we must remain focused on the four main questions that drive our focus on students. What do we want students to know? How will we know they learned it? How will we respond when students do not learn? And how will we extend learning for students who are already proficient? And this leads us tonight to bring you the discussion, the first of two parts around our grading policy. This grading policy is a follow-up from last month's meeting where we shared information with you to answer this very important question about how students are doing academically. I wanna thank the teachers who've reached out and written to us with their concerns. Of course, our media partners as we navigate this most important topic of grading policy. As I believe strongly that we must approach this work through a set of beliefs about our school system and our purpose. Let me share with you a set of guiding principles we hold to be true as we now land squarely in the reality that education has changed. And let me be clear that this pandemic is not creating temporary changes to education, but really launching us into a new paradigm of education. The following set of beliefs speaks to why we exist and who we serve. We believe that each student deserves to be known for their unique assets of cultural and linguistic identity, social emotional strengths, prior knowledge and lived experience. We believe that each student deserves a safe and affirming learning environment that is intentionally designed to reflect their multiple identities. We believe that students deserve a personalized learning experience in order to realize their full potential and desire to learn. We believe that learning results from an authentic and positive relationship between educators and families in which the well being of the student is the focus. We believe that when students experience challenges, we approach students using restorative and trauma informed approaches. And we believe that we must address the significant disproportionality and overrepresentation of Latino and Latina students in special education by implementing multi tiered systems of support that ultimately benefit all students. And we believe that every student has the right to access and success in the highest levels of instruction and opportunity. Based on these beliefs, we will not only make it our mission to serve the students in our community, but we'll also serve our teachers and our staff because we understand that in order for us to succeed, we must be in it all together. This means that we will, be continue, we will continue to be agile, adaptable, and flexible while leading us forward toward reopening schools in a safe environment, provide additional opportunities for our teachers whose job duties continue to change, and most importantly, provide the compassion and guidance needed to ensure the self-care, respect, and collaboration needed to keep all safe. Our intent is to promote the three R's, respect, responsibility, and readiness that is asked of all of us during these times. I would like to thank our guest presenters tonight who will lead us in this work and continue to make our school safe and ready for the return of students on campus, which is our primary goal. I also would be remiss if I didn't mention that I've heard from some parents who continue to be concerned about reopening schools and others who continue to support school reopening. Let me reassure parents that they will continue to have a choice, whether it's quality distance learning education or quality in-person education for their students. And let me reiterate, this pandemic is not creating temporary changes to education, but launching us into a new paradigm of education. So with that, I'd like to start our uh, presentation and get our slides up, please, Mr. Rickman and remind us that there are many parts to our uh, looking at our system. Uh, next slide, please. Through a lens of looking at our facilities, our staffing, our health and safety preparedness, and of course, continuing to provide 
choices for in-person or distance learning to our families. And our next slide, here you can see that we have modified our timeline for re-entry based on the, the uh, continued surge of COVID in our community, which we'll hear more from in a few minutes from Dr. Fitzgibbons and Susan Klein Rothschild. Uh, as you can see board members that we plan to resurvey our parents in elementary schools, along with continued staff COVID testing beginning next week looking at our small courts and athletics and the readiness for that also next week. And lastly, aiming for our hybrid learning opening in elementary once we reach under 28 cases per 100,000 residents in our, in our county. So next, I would like to uh, welcome back to us, I believe it is Dr. Lynn Fitzgibbons, who's with us today to give us her update about what is happening in our community. Dr. Fitzgibbons. Thank you. Are we good? You can see, everyone can see it now. Thank you for your patience. So I'm going to just quickly, I think, uh, summarize what everyone's uh, well aware of, which is uh, unfortunately we are seeing um, what we really had hoped we would not see in our community, which is um, a, a quite remarkable surge in cases in COVID-19. Um, I will not uh, subject you to a, a long lecture on uh, the history of the, of the epidemiology and um, take you week by week through this last um, six or eight weeks. Um, but suffice to say, um, our surge is uh, absolutely here, and uh, we're feeling it here in the hospital where I'm still sitting this evening. Um, if we look at the new cases reported daily across Santa Barbara County from the beginning of the epidemic to now, and uh, credit the wonderful community dashboard, which again continues to be um, a real, uh, I think, rock for all of us in following this epidemic, we see, unfortunately, that our county's um, new cases reported every day um, have really continued to spike to levels that many of us thought um, we may not reach. Of course, yesterday we had news of um, close to 500 new cases reported. Um, and that uh, was in the wake of um, quite a heavy weekend with regards to reported uh, cases per day over even the holiday weekend. If you look um, here at the, the slide I'm showing, reminds us of the conversation we were having eight weeks ago, transitions between um, reds and purples um, at that threshold of 32, um, a long distant memory, unfortunately, at this point. Um, when we then look at hospitalizations and uh, I would say squarely my world, um, unfortunately, we know that within a, a few weeks of sur a surge or a change in the community condition, we then feel it in the hospital. And that's really, um, I think, what is, of course, uh, very newsworthy at this point um, with really um, quite remarkable um, events occurring across our region, including in the area of, of course, Los Angeles County. Looking here at Santa Barbara County's hospitalization rates in the light peach color and ICU um, rates in the uh, darker red color from again March to now. You can follow it through what we experienced over the summer with the summer surge coming and then of course um, our excellent community control of that surge and uh, the numbers falling down through again the beginning of November and we see this uh, again very very sharp increase in the hospitaliz hospitalized patients with COVID-19 um, across our county. Again, this is Santa Barbara County data I'm showing you. We also know that it takes, uh, at, just as it takes um, uh, sometimes um, one, two or three weeks for the hospitals to feel the impact of changes in the community rates, the community diagnoses, um, so too follows the ICU. And so um, what we're certainly feeling in the ICU this week, more than even last week, are increases in the ICU numbers. Um, the numbers are hitting a place where I think we will all see in the news um, likely tomorrow that our county's adjusted um, ICU capacity has unfortunately crossed that threshold of zero. 
um, for um, the Santa Barbara County area. This is the adjusted ICU capacity. Um, this doesn't mean that um, our ICUs close their doors, lock it, and don't let another person in, of course. Uh, this simply means that we as a county are really at that point where we're transitioning to doing surge care. Um, so taking care of uh, patients under um, what we call surge circumstances. Um, we still have beds. We still have, um, you know, um, creative ways to staff those beds, um, even if we don't have our usual capacity to do things the way that we usually do. And then uh, let's talk squarely about ICU capacity. Um, I, I, uh, I copied this slide um, right before this meeting. And, uh, and this, is, uh, this is, I think, what, what I'm talking about. So if you follow me on the red, this is back from beginning of November until today. If you follow me on the, and excuse me, and your y-axis here um, is uh, the percent of available ICU capacity. If you follow um, the red line here, that's our Southern California region, which everyone remembers around the middle of December, um, also hit zero ICU capacity. Again, just to remind everyone, that doesn't mean that there isn't, uh, you know, the ability to care for one more ICU patient, but rather um, simply that we're, we're moving into that surge territory where we're doing things that we wouldn't normally do to try to accommodate the patients that continue to come. When you look here at the dark uh, green, you're seeing our Santa Barbara County adjusted ICU capacity. Um, again, uh, had been intact really through December, middle of December, um, but unfortunately in these last three weeks has uh, fallen sharp, sharply now, perhaps the last two weeks. Um, and uh, it's a complicated conversation. I imagine we'll hear a lot more about it um, based on just this information that I'm giving you right now. Um, but there's actually um, an adjustment factor based on um, the actual um, capacity that we have in the county versus um, the adjusted capacity, which is a, a correction factor based on the percentage of the ICU beds that are being used to care for COVID patients. So another, a long complicated conversation for a different day. Ultimately, what does all this mean? It means that our ICUs are strained. It means that our ICUs are being used um, to care for a lot of COVID patients. And it really means um, that in Santa Barbara County, um, we are continuing the pattern that we've seen many times before where the Southern California region numbers um, really um, led us by a few weeks and now we are following that pattern. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that, um, you know, a, a, if, if again, um, tragically the Los Angeles County area, for example, or pockets of it are hitting um, true crisis um, and uh, really um, some circumstances that are um, perhaps somewhat catastrophic, we're hearing in, of course, the media, that doesn't necessarily mean that several weeks from now, we're heading to that place. We are a different community. We're a different county um, than, of course, the Los Angeles County area. And um, I think that all, all it means to me is that, uh, unfortunately, um, just as this epidemic has hit our region hard, it is uh, absolutely hitting our county and our community um, very, very hard. I didn't have a slide about this, but I think everyone on the on the meeting is well aware, board members are well aware that uh, earlier in the epidemic during the summer surge, we had a disproportionate impact in our North County area. And of course this time around, that's not the case. This time around, as we look at Marion hospital numbers go up, the cottage hospital numbers go up and um, this is really affecting all of us. And so just to summarize, I think uh, and reiterate, um, unfortunately our community cases are surging. Um, we really truly have more active infectious people in our community than ever before. Our hospitals are feeling a significant surge now, particularly related to strains and staffing. Um, we do anticipate an increase, an ongoing increase in hospitalization and ICU, ICU needs over um, likely this, the next small number of weeks, um, particularly following the Christmas and New Year holiday period. Just to pause and remind everyone, if there were already a lot of cases circulating and then people interacted with one another, perhaps unknowingly with COVID. Um, we anticipate that that'll impact of us, of course, uh, through the month of January, for example. And then uh, just to finish with perhaps some better news, um, I really am thrilled with how well the vaccine rollout has gone. 
at Cottage Health, I'm over the moon to say that we're close to 3,000 vaccines, um, perhaps even at 3,000 now, um, administered as of today. Um, just a huge effort. It's going incredibly well. The Public Health Department, I understand, had great success with a rollout to EMS this week um, today at the Page, Youth, uh, the Page Center. Um, and so, again, I think lots of uh, very positive signals that uh, the light is at the end of the tunnel. So I'm actually going to pause there. Um, that's, uh, that's all I prepared with regards to presenting the epidemiology. And I'm going to pause and deliberately say, I didn't paint a rosy picture. It's not rosy in the hospital right now. It's pretty tough. Despite all that, I am confident that our community is going to get a handle on this over the coming weeks. And I'm confident that we're going to bend our curve. I'm confident in it. I don't know when it's going to happen. And I actually am I'm quite sure, too, that we're going to have a few bad weeks um, immediately ahead of us. But then I'm confident that the curve is going to bend and we're going to head back down. And despite all this, I would say, and this is editorial from just a doc um, to all you education experts, despite all this, I cannot think of a higher priority than getting um, our students back in their classrooms. And so I appreciate this conversation. I appreciate my, my follow, my, my, the, the following uh, expert uh, behind me, uh, um, Susan Klein Rothschild and what she's going to say, I think, uh, but I just wanted to reiterate that uh, this is the context and yet um, what you were discussing tonight and where you are um, hopefully uh, heading, um, I think is, uh, is critically important. So I'll, I'll close uh, Hilda with that, with that final comment. Thank you so much, Dr. Fitzgibbons, and you're definitely one of our heroes, and, and we appreciate so much you making even time to be with us tonight, in spite of the fact that you're dealing with so much as a doctor, and we send you good thoughts and, and good self-care as well. Thank you. Um, with that, uh, board members, we'll continue with Susan Klein Rothschild, another great partner to us. Thank you, and I'm hoping the uh, panel can help open my video. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me join you again today. I, I know we just heard from Dr. Fitzgibbons about the seriousness of the situation in Santa Barbara County, and that's very real. We also have some positive things in addition to the upcoming vaccine. We have learned a lot more about COVID now than we knew in July when we were planning for schools. And so part of what I'm going to be presenting, and I'm actually using the same slides Governor Newsom used when he did his presentation on November 30th. So you can all know what direction the state is headed. And of course, in Santa Barbara County, we will follow. And as Governor Newsom said, we need our children to learn. It's not negotiable. Learning is not negotiable and neither is safety. So the Save Schools for All plan, which is being put forward by the state, is to help get children back in classrooms where they learn best, and do it safely for both students and staff, starting with youngest children. And that's what we'll see today. So next slide, please. So we're talking about what has happened, what we know to limit transmission in the schools and what we know about what has happened with transmission in the schools. Well, I'll share some slides the governor shared about how infrequent actual transmission of COVID is in schools, particularly with younger students. And I can tell you here in Santa Barbara County, we have seen the same thing. We have over 30 schools or school districts that opened under an elementary waiver. We know those schools that have opened and the number of COVID cases that have come forward. And most of those transmissions, a huge percentage are from family members and from activities outside of school, gatherings, weddings, families getting together, not in school. We are not seeing transmissions from one student to another student or students to staff or staff to students. The transmissions are happening outside of school. So this is really important for us to know what do we do to pre prevent transmission and what is the actual transmission? Next slide, please. So there are a few studies that have looked at children who tested positive and children who tested negative for COVID and said, what are the differences between these children who tested positive or negative? And they looked at two different states 
And the things they found had nothing to do with whether they're in school or not. It was whether they had gatherings, whether they were family, or if they were in a school that did not require masks. That was a big factor. So we are learning from the science what works. Next slide, please. So there are a lot of things that we know work, and this is part of what the science is now showing us. And these are the things that were largely put in place in July. And now that we are having experience with it, we can see the outcomes of those. The facial coverings, the masks, the physical distance between people, having stable groups, not mixing groups up, washing hands, ventilation, which you'll hear more about tonight, and screenings of people upon arrival at school or before school. Every one of those measures we take gives another layer of safety and another barrier for protection. So the schools that have not required these measures, they've seen two and a half times more outbreaks than the schools that do. Next slide, thank you. So we know that there are a lot of benefits from in-person learning, in addition to the academic ones. You have discussed at your board uh, in previous meetings, a number of children who are falling behind academically, and that is of great concern to us. We're also concerned about the emotional impacts. We're seeing anxiety and depression. We're concerned about child abuse and neglect. Those kids are not being seen outside of their homes and they're more at risk of abuse. We have higher rates of, of not getting the immunizations that are required. That leaves children open for other, uh, other considerations and other concerns that we have. And so there are lots of reasons and things that we're seeing that we have found in this fall semester where the kids who are going to school in class, many of them are seeing very positive outcomes. And we want that opportunity for each child, knowing that some families and some children will still opt to do remote learning. Next slide, please. So we're talking about a new approach and the governor described this approach as safe schools for all. So all children would have the opportunity to be in school. And the idea is that we start with the youngest children, TK through second grade, and then third grade through sixth grade, special education and populations that are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. And that we support all communities to help get those kids an opportunity to have in-person learning, in-class learning by this spring and having the ongoing option to have remote learning for any of the children and any of the families. That's the goal of the, the governor's plan. Next slide, please. So the governor says, this plan is going to ensure schools can provide safe in-person instruction and safe for students and safe for staff. We want everyone's safety to be of great concern. Next slide, please. So there are some key elements and this is only a, a high level slide that, that reviews that those elements for you in a very high level way. And I just share with you, the governor did raise this and bring this forward in a high level way on December 30th. He said that more detail is coming and we are all eager to have that detail. We do not yet have it. Um, the first element, there are four pillars, is funding. If we want students and staff to be able to come back to in-person learning, we need to have funding to support that. So there'll be funding at a student level basis, plus additional funding for low income families, English learners, foster youth, and others that are disproportionately impacted. That's one, one pillar of this plan. The second pillar is about safety and mitigation. Um, and that pillar you see here includes four different elements, testing, PPE, contact tracing, and vaccinations. The governor and the state are talking about much more frequent testing. One of the comments that was made as part of the preliminary uh, broad brush was that for counties that are in the purple tier, it'll either be weekly or every other week testing for staff. That's much more frequent than our every two months testing now. And they're also looking at potential testing for students. Again, we wait for more detail from the governor and the state on that. They're looking at having more uh, 
protective equipment um, and looking at uh, surgical masks. Um, and one of the important aspects of this new plan is that every school needs to have a safety plan. Now, elementary school waivers included a similar plan like the safety plan that the state is now talking about. Santa Barbara Unified created an elementary school waiver and they brought it forward to the public health department for consultation. That was a really successful activity and I'm really pleased that the, the district did that because over the break there was communication about that plan. So SB Unified is now more prepared to do a plan that will be successful and effective. The state has said there will be no more elementary waivers under this new plan. It will all be done with the safety plan and these other factors. So Santa Barbara Unified is looking at having testing, looking at having the safety plan, all the new pieces in place. A next key pillar is uh, oversight and assistance. This is really important. The state's going to take a much larger role in assisting and supporting our schools and our school districts. There is a work group that has been established at the state level, including many experts who are going to help participate and help make these things a reality. We talk a lot about what needs to happen and there's so much complexity. We need hands-on support to make this work and make it a safe place for students and staff. And the last pillar is transparency and accountability. The state is really looking at having a way that families and others can know what's going on in their local school districts. They will have a hotline, they will have a web portal, there will be an alternative for a dashboard so each family can look and everyone locally can look what's the COVID case rate at my school and my district. So this is just a very high level put forward by the governor, but these are key elements that are put in place so we can both have in-person instruction and the best learning for our students, as well as have safety for the students and staff. That's the goal of this overall plan. So I know this is a very high level. We all wait the governor and the state's detailed guidance. We expect it soon. And when we do, we will be sharing it broadly. So with that, I'll pass it back to you, Hilda. Thank you so much, Suzanne. And uh, board members, as you can see on the right column, uh, has some of the things that we've already prepared or that we've, we've are ready to follow up on, as uh, Susan has explained. Uh, we are as pleased that our safety plans are starting to fall uh, into alignment and feel confident that as soon as that template comes out, we'll be ready to drop all that information to the new template, if that may be the case. We also know that one of the things that the uh, governor asked was for this um, collaboration with our labor partners, which I know Dr. Becchio has uh, reached out to both uh, Karen McBride and Paul Rooney, and we're happy to report that they are also on board with us as we all are in this together. So more to be uh, shared with the board as guidance continues to come our way. On our next slide, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Wagenick to talk to us a little bit about a question that came up in our last meeting around um, infection rates in our small cohorts and athletics groups. Dr. Wagenick. All right, <clears throat> thank you. Um, board, as of uh, December 18th, 2020, we had um, 89 academic small cohorts and um, 26 elective cohorts. Um, through the course of, of the fall, we have needed to close 10 of those cohorts. Um, for 14 day quarantine because of close contact with a positive case. Um, however, there have been um, zero known transmissions of COVID-19 in any of our small cohorts. Um, the top chart there um, represents the, the number of students and adults who were involved in small cohorts and uh, or athletics on our campus. And as you can see there, um, the rate of positive cases, um, those trends um, align with what we know to be true, align with what Dr. Fitzgibbons and um, Susan Klein Rothschild have, have shared again tonight. 
Um, and that is that younger students um, do contract COVID-19, but uh, not at the same rate um, as older teens. Um, and, and that's represented by the 1% of athletes who have um, tested positive thus far. And then of course, um, the older teens are not contracting COVID-19 at the same rate as our adults who are on campus. We've had a 4.2% um, positive, positive rate um, amongst those individuals. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to come back and share with you again I'll say it one last time, there have been, to our knowledge, zero known transmissions of COVID-19 um, on the campuses. All of these are um, community and, and home transmissions of um, COVID-19. Thank you, Dr. Wagenick. And board members, one of the other items, if we can go back one slide, uh, Mr. Rickman, the, the transparency and accountability, the, the state will be also preparing a dashboard, uh, Susan, I believe to be, so that we can make these kinds of uh, data points transparent at the state level. So there will be some reporting feature of similar information coming forward. So if we can move to the next couple slides um, we do plan to return to uh, small cohorts on Monday, January 11th, but Dr. Wagenick, along with Dr. Becchio and I, in a new COVID-19 task force that we've put together, we'll be reassessing and um, looking at the infection rates as Dr. Fitzgibbons has reported to us today. And that's true for both our small cohorts and our next slide, which shows our athletics. Um, there is new guidance um, on youth sports, which include mask wearing throughout practice, which didn't used to be the case prior. Um, and so those are some of the things that we'll be looking at as we move towards a small cohort and athletic reopening. And uh, now I wanna introduce a new topic uh, to all of you today. We can go to our next slide. We've been lucky, uh, we're so lucky in Santa Barbara and I knew that before when I came and of course now that I'm here because we have some amazing parents and staff members and students and we're lucky to have two parents with us who are uh, Rachel Siegelman and Todd Squires to talk to us, uh, their, their parents and their UCSB professors and we can go to our next slide, chemical engineering professors. And please read the small print at the bottom of the slide, not indoor air quality experts, but they have really lent us their expertise, which is the beauty of this community, so that we can really think about all the possible ways that we can make our schools the safest possible. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel and Todd. To tell us a little bit about the work they've been doing with uh, Steve Vizzolini and his team as we prepare our schools to open. Thanks. Um, as uh... Dr. Maldonado said, uh, Todd and I are both parents first and professors of chemical engineering second. And we volunteered mostly because we care a lot about getting our kids back to school and also realize that um, there is an interesting place where uh, our knowledge of chemical engineering overlaps a lot with how to get the classrooms ready, we hope. Um, can we go to the next slide? I forgot that I'm not controlling this. So not to go too much into uh, the epidemiology of COVID, but to talk a little bit about why ventilation is important. Um, viruses essentially transmit three ways. One via, via close contact and airborne, both of which basically mean through the air, and uh, via surfaces, what's frequently called fomite deposition. And um, all three of these tend to result in virus transmission of really any kind, including COVID. Can you keep going? Next slide. So at this point, the CDC and the WHO both agree that the primary mode of COVID transmission is in the air. And you'll hear a lot about both droplet and airborne transmission, which really have to do with the size of the particles that people are exhaling and others are inhaling. And for the purposes of this conversation, that's a little less important than the fact that it's in the air. And so what that means, if you go to the next slide, is exactly what Susan Klein Rothschild was saying which is that uh, protection against COVID is actually a very many layered thing. And she was talking a lot about physical distancing, trying to keep people apart, um, 
face masks, washing your hands, contact tracing, disinfection, the health screenings um, and the testing, but the ventilation is actually one layer of this. And I particularly like the Swiss cheese model way of thinking about it because none of these layers are perfect, but getting as good, as many layers as we can layer together and each layer as with as few holes as we can is our best route towards protection. And so Todd and I are here basically to talk about that ventilation piece of it um, and just that one slice. Can you go to the next slide? So um, masks absolutely help with the, with the airborne and the close contact part of it. And they're already a big part of this plan. So does social distancing and so does hand hygiene. And so what we're talking about with respect to ventilation and I'll throw filtration in there too, is trying to reduce the amount of virus that's in the air so that there's less for your mask to do in terms of filtration and there's less probability that you'll inhale it or the kids will inhale it. You go to the next slide. Um, and so what that really means in terms of ventilation for a classroom uh, is what's becoming clear is that what you want to do is to change out the air in the classroom as many times per hour as possible. So that if there's a kid who's sick in the room, um, you don't allow very much of that virus to accumulate in the room air. So you're flushing it out as much as you can. So there are a couple of pieces of this, and that's the uh, picture in the bottom left that I can't point at, um, is that you need to layer all these pieces together. The first one is that you want the air conditioning or forced air system to be set to 100% outside air. You wanna be bringing in all fresh air and not recirculating air. And the reason is you don't want that virus just to keep recirculating in the room. And in particular, you don't want a air conditioning system that is shared between several classrooms to be bringing virus from one cohort to another cohort, right? So you want it to be bringing in 100% outside air. Um, and then the other piece of this is that the pre-COVID regulations on classrooms uh, were set to try and keep carbon dioxide the kids were exhaling from building up in the room. Um, but they were actually set at a relatively modest number of air changeovers per hour, two or three, which is pretty good in a normal classroom. But uh, Harvard School of Public Health and um, we understand various other school systems are all kind of narrowing in on the fact that we need many more air changes per hour. Harvard's uh, ideal recommendation is around six. Um, that means that if there's six air changes per hour, in on average, a exhaled virus stays in the room for about 10 minutes. So how do you achieve that? Well, that's what the little illustration is showing you. If you have a sick kid exhaling virus, what you're trying to do is to open windows and perhaps even put fans in those windows to try and make as much air go out of the room as you can um, to increase that flow rate. You, you might supplement with a portable air cleaner, a HEPA filter that will also help remove some of those droplets and part particulates to really get your uh, levels higher. Um, you go to the next slide. So what Todd and I have started doing um, is measuring the number of air changes per hour. That was not something we really knew about most of the classrooms. It's um, not something that was all that important uh, up until now. So this is a picture of me. I'm in the far corner by the windows and uh, Mr. Woodward from um, Dos Pueblos doing this measurement. So what we do is we use carbon dioxide as a proxy for the virus. And we see how quickly it's removed by the ventilation. And that tells us how fast the ventilation system is working. So we use dry ice, um, which is carbon dioxide, and a fan to really increase the CO2 level in the room, carbon dioxide level. Um, and we have a number of these little uh, carbon dioxide monitors. We actually put around the classroom to make sure that all points in the classroom are functioning the same. And then we watch how quickly that uh, level decays over the time. And that tells us how fast air is being exchanged in the room. Can you go to the next slide? So this is a sample room. This happens to be a really good room because it has windows in two opposite corners, right? So it gets some really good cross flow. When the room's doors were closed and the windows were closed, it only got half an air changeover per hour, right? So in general, um, air would stay in the room for two hours and that's not a lot of air changeover. That's not what you would want in this situation. So of course, what you do is you open the windows. And in this case, you open the windows, you go to two and a half air changes per hour, which is right where a classroom should be. It's pretty good, but it's nowhere near what people are recommending for the COVID situation. Um, in this room, because it had cross flow windows, we uh, opened the cross flow doors 
And that got us all the way up to an ACH of 10, which is great. It's way above the recommendation. It's a lot of air changeovers. And it wasn't a hard thing to do. Case, it was just opening those cross flow doors, but you need to know to do it in that class. Can you go to the next slide? So as you know, not all classrooms are designed quite so perfectly for this situation where they have that cross flow. Um, so we measured a few rooms. This is just three, maybe I shouldn't say conclusions, three sample rooms at Dos Pueblos. Um, most of the rooms with the windows closed and the doors closed were between 0.5 and two air changes per hour. So pretty low. Um, if you open the windows, you get to three to five. So you're getting pretty close in some rooms, but not quite as high as we'd really like to see. Um, if we open the windows and Dos Pueblos only has windows along one wall of most rooms, if we open those windows, um, it doesn't really, and that's what the pictures at the bottom are showing you, it's hard to get enough flow. But if we put a fan in one of the windows or in the door facing outwards, and we want the fan facing out so that we're not mixing the room. So we're not mixing around virus in the room if a kid is sick, but we're rather suctioning air out of the room to try and get the virus out. We can get all of those rooms up to seven to 13 air changes per hour. So we can get them all into a really high flow rate. They're using uh, standard uh, stand fans, most of which were already in the classroom or box fans that some teachers had already put over their windows. Um, the rooms with cross flow windows were of course best. We could get those to ACH of six without adding fans, but we know we're, we're stuck with the architecture we've got. So I'm showing you a relatively inexpensive way to get the ventilation systems um, up to where we'd want in this situation. Can you go to the next slide? Um, in some situations, uh, a HEPA filter can help a lot. So this is a slide from a friend of mine who is an air quality expert, uh, faculty at Columbia. And she's showing how the percentage risk of catching COVID drops with the use of a HEPA filter. And the x-axis is that ACH number I've been showing you, the air changes per hour. And what you're seeing is that at low air changes per hour, the HEPA filter gives you a pretty significant risk reduction, sometimes as much as 25 to 50%. And that's really because it's helping uh, pull out the particulates um, in the air. It's not as good as having an ACA that's high on its own. It can really help boost your ACH, if you wanna think of it that way, up into a good zone. Um, these can be uh, store-bought HEPA filters. You, we used a lot of them during the Thomas fire. Um, they're also designed, this is from Yale School of Public Health for making HEPA filters using just a simple box fan and a bunch of the air of uh, the filters one normally uses on the intake for your HVAC system uh, and some duct tape. So um, there are a lot of options here to get the, get the systems up to where we need. Can you go to the next slide? So the conclusions are essentially that since COVID spreads through the air, proper ventilation can really help reduce the amount of inhalable virus in the room. So it's a good layer of that Swiss cheese. Um, but in order to get to that good ventilation, what you need to do is to change the HVAC, if you've got it, to 100% outside air and um, change the COVID, the ventilation system to match kind of the COVID situation, where what you want is to have as many air changes per hour as possible. The measurements aren't too challenging, and they allow us to start to optimize rooms, to start and put in fans and other uh, modifications that could get as towards those recommendations on the order of air, five to six air changeovers per hour. Um, and the classrooms we've measured were pretty easily modified um, so far. Uh, and supplemental HEPA filters can help remove those infectious particles. Are there any questions? I think you have a couple more slides and you want to just uh, uh, happy to keep going. Uh, okay, so this one we can skip. <laughs> I think everyone understands we're parents. Um, that was your backup slide. It, this is just a backup for anybody who's from more of a facilities ventilation background. Um, just to say that air changers per hour, the reason we're having to measure this is that this is not how we normally think about ventilation systems. Normally we think about um, the uh, cubic feet per minute that are flowing through a window or through an air system. Um, and now we have to convert that with the volume of the room to think about how often the whole room's air has changed over. Thank you, Rachel and Todd. Um, before we go to this next slide, let's pause here for a moment. Um, I do want to let you know, board members, that uh, Rachel and Todd will be working, like I said, with Steve Vizzolini, our facilities uh, director, along with some of the maintenance staff. Starting tomorrow, we're going to be going to Adams Elementary School to take a look at 
and and they've been generous enough to also um, help us with this learning to to train our staff and to have us you know look work with some of their graduate students as well so we're happy to to enter into this important partnership and, and are so grateful to both Rachel and Todd. President uh, Ford, if it's okay with you, is it appropriate? Might we wanna just stop for a moment and ask, uh, allow for some questions? I know we have four public comments and then we had the next topic is the grading policy. So what, what are your thoughts here? Uh, I think we should keep going. Okay. Will you, are you fine with that? Yes, I just want to make sure that our, our, our panelists and our guest speakers are continuing with us as we get to this next section. So we'll turn this little corner here, uh, go to our next slide. And I've already read these belief statements about what we think about students and going back to our really important questions about how are they doing academically. So with that, I'd like to introduce our next slide to begin to think about um, how we might approach our grading policy, especially after having seen the uh, high number of Ds and Fs, or the increase, I should say, of Ds and Fs and ones and twos out of our fall semester. Next slide. And I'll turn it over to Ms. Sean Carey and Ms. Anna Escobedo to give us an update on our proposed language for changes to our grading policy, which board members, we're only sharing with you our initial thinking today. At next board meeting on January 12th is when we'll ask for your vote and action on this proposed change to our policy. Thank you, Superintendent Maldonado and good evening, President Ford and members of the board. Um, I'm happy to be grounded in those belief statements that Superintendent Maldonado read, and they're certainly uh, applicable and relevant in applying that type of thinking to the way that we approach grading and evaluating student work more generally. Um, You'll see on the next slide a list that is not exhaustive of the different districts we've been tracking and in some cases consulting with and some of the things that we see as common threads beyond our district are showing up as, as uh, philosophical underpinnings of the principles we want to put forward that should guide our practices for grading and distance learning environment. I'll highlight the importance of uh, across many districts. It's been recognized the importance of being flexible and sensitive to factors that are beyond a student's control. That learning uh, or the grades should be measures of learning as opposed to attributes that we can associate with compliance, such as work habits and behaviors. Um, it's actually not allowable to connect grades to attendance, for example. Not everyone knows that. Um, that just as grades are one metric for communicating about a student's performance, we also hold that multiple metrics should inform a grade and that those should be varied in terms of their nature. And that grades should be what's called asset oriented, meaning they help us know more about what a student can show they know and they help acknowledge what a student can achieve as opposed to penalizing what a student does not yet know or has not yet achieved. So these are all principles that apply um, regardless of the pandemic and independently of the pandemic, but become particularly important and essential to us uh, for consideration as we think in particular about sensitivity to factors beyond a student's control given pandemic conditions. Next slide, please. I think it's important for us to remember where we've been um, since the pandemic, since the inception of the pandemic and the closure, the emergency closure of schools last March, um, March 13th to be precise. We went through, through an intensive process, the whole nation did, to try to understand the ramifications of the pandemic on K-12 education, but it didn't just involve the K-12 system. Uh, it involved our UC and CSU system in California. It involved our community college system. It involved the college board, the governing entities over AP exams and PSATs and SATs. Um, it involved the IB organization, various different distant, distinct entities weighing in and providing guidance um, that came th to us through the CDE about the latitude that local districts had to determine the 
the appropriate student responsive grading policies uh, for the pandemic conditions given all the disruption to the system. At that time, the board adopted a grading policy in response to emergency school closure that specifically recommended a credit, no credit system for secondary students with a letter grade option and for elementary students suspended term three report card grades and instead uh, provided for ongoing feedback from teachers to families. Some of those systems and entities and including the California Department of Education, um, their guidance continued and extended through the summer of 2020. So when we got to August, August, the beginning of this school year, there was a reversion back to tr traditional grading policies. Not every case was there a reversion back to traditional grading practices, but traditional grading policies were back in effect. Letter grades need to come back in effect because of the, uh, the, the university systems not extending the waiver um, uh, for the credit, no credit marks. And as we've all experienced, there was a focus on how to be effective with distance learning, lots of professional learning. Uh, supporting that as well as to enhance our, our social emotional learning efforts and to expand existing learning supports in response to the pandemic. We then have experienced and are coming up on the midway point of our school year and throughout the fall term we have been studying our student engagement data and our student academic performance data and it's now in response to the kind of data we're seeing both quantitatively and qualitatively that we're at a point where it's become very apparent that we need to re-examine what is the appropriate grading policy to establish to give clarity to students families and staff about how we can effectively evaluate and communicate student progress during these times and these conditions next slide please I want to remind uh, the board and, and re reiterate that our findings academically for the secondary space, um, and again, focusing on grades, are that roughly a third of our secondary students are earning a D or F in at least one class. And that there's an increase in the number of students getting three or more Ds and Fs compared to prior years. I wanna say something about the, a, a word about Ds. <laughs> Um, so we know that a D is considered passing a class and it's important to pass courses to uh, earn a high school diploma and that is important. But it's equally important to understand that it, uh, in 2020 and in 2021, a high school diploma is a necessary but not sufficient criteria for being deemed college and career ready. So while a D is preferable to not earning credit or not passing a course, it still derails a student from college career readiness. So that's why you see this emphasis on Ds as well as Fs, which of course are concerning because they signal that a student has not earned, a credit, earned credit for the course that they've been enrolled in. Finally, we've been able to observe and we've shared with the, with the board that we do see that the rates of Ds and Fs are disproportionately high among four traditionally underserved student groups in our district. Um, next slide, please. The acute nature of the inequity for the four traditionally underserved students um, is an amplified effect of what we see embedded in some of the inequities of the traditional grading policy uh, pre-pandemic. We have a responsibility now that we understand the effect and impact of the pandemic in combination with the traditional grading policy to offer and propose a distance learning grading policy that is student-centered uh, and that is and, and through which staff will be uh, supported in applying. Again, grades are not the only measure of student success. Uh, they are, however, an important measure of student success and they are important gatekeeper of student access to future learning. So we do have to emphasize and focus on the grading policy for those reasons for secondary students in particular. What we see here is that we know a, learning, a grading policy has to both honor the rigor of the instructional program and of the teacher's curriculum and, and instructional practice 
while also ensuring that we're holding students harmless, especially from factors beyond their control, and especially for those students who face additional barriers, in this case, more acutely due to the pandemic. The proposal suggests a grading policy wherein letter grades of A, B, and C can be assigned to students based on the work and learning that students demonstrate and that other options available are an incomplete for st students who are near uh, or who are, are near to and close to completing a uh, demonstration of skills and standards and essential learning that would earn them a passing grade of C or higher, as well as a no credit in lieu of an F uh, for students who have had such difficulties with engaging or completing learning associated with a course that it is not appropriate to assign credit, but we also want to protect them from the punitive effects of an F grade on a GPA. In both the cases of an incomplete mark and a no credit mark, it's important that all parties, student, families, and classroom teacher, and a student's counselor understand the ramifications of what an incomplete mark means and what a no credit mark means as far as ramifications to the student. So in both cases, we want to make sure that there is a, there is a documented case of that communication having been having taken place with a student and his or her family. We have a lot more guidance that is specific, both in terms of how to apply this policy, which is both, which both lays out expectations and also some guardrails for, for teacher practice, um, but also just procedural guidance that's in development and pending the board's approval of the policy next week. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over, if we can go to the next slide, to my counterpart, Ms. Escobedo for elementary. Good evening, Santa Barbara. Thank you, uh, um, Ms. Carey, for uh, that and for setting this up. And um, we know, we realize that this is uh, obviously very secondary heavy, but we are, in fact, Santa Barbara unified. And as such, uh, we are unified in our efforts because we know that our students are our students K through 12. Uh, so similarly in elementary, uh, as we reported at a, our last board meeting, um, our first reporting period grades demonstrated that approximately a third of our students um, did receive ones and twos in reading, writing, or math, which is in fact an increase from the same time uh, last year, uh, the same reporting period. Our tr traditionally underserved students um, are still the ones that are being most affected. Uh, and these include our Hispanic students, our students with disabilities, uh, soci socioeconomically disadvantaged, and of course, our emergent multilingual students. Our findings also showed that uh, the elementary report cards are not standards-based and they do not include grading for ELD standards nor ELD development. Uh, so making this, highlighting the, 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 the priority of making sure we finalize the good work that has already been started here in Santa Barbara towards new report cards that are, are uh, obviously standards-based uh, aligned and making sure that we get those uh, completed and well on their way to uh, roll out for next school year. Next slide, please. So the distance learning grading proposal for elementary is slightly different than in secondary. And of course, you know, our, our, our lovely pets love to make an appearance at our board meetings as well. So uh, they too are in favor of uh, this proposal, which includes that uh, we would like to go into effect for the second trimester reporting period in, in March, um, which is in actuality an enforcement of California Ed Code, which states that one, parents and guardians must be given midpoint notifications at each of the three reporting periods if their child is in jeopardy of not making progress or adequate progress towards meeting standard proficiency in any core subjects. 
This also means that teachers would have to offer parents the opportunity to meet and discuss those areas of concern, as well as multiple supports and interventions provided in class and outside of class, and any extended opportunities for their students to achieve proficiency. And by this, making sure that we are doing this across all elementary sites. And uh, last bullet there, documentation of specific interventions, supports, and multiple opportunities offered, as well as the outcomes of those efforts must be not just offered, but also documented so that um, that final report card or before issuing that final score of a one and two um, in any core academic subject area on the final report card. This opportunity uh, to enforce ed code will also allow us to calibrate our grading practices uh, with the current report cards through the end of this school year. Uh, but more importantly, it is a, a prepare, preparing us for our transition into our new standards-based report cards for the 2021-2022 school year. That's hard to say. Um, and, and in closing, again, uh, for elementary, it's not as heavy a lift uh, for now, uh, but I would like to end by saying, you know, uh, one big question that has been asked is why now? Why the urgency this moment? Um, first and foremost, uh, you do what the best you can until you know better. Now we know better. Now our data has told us that we need to do better by our students. And so having said that, we have been presented uh, with the opportunity through COVID to launch into the 21st century, something I believe we will thank COVID for one day. But along with that opportunity to be launched into the 21st century, um, there is a significantly changing, significantly changing opportunity as well to have to change um, those grading practices uh, to match with these 21st century new learning practices. So now is, is the right time. And we are hoping that uh, this is something that you consider uh, so that we can continue the good work and opportunities for Santa Barbara Unified uh, K through 12. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to turn it over uh, back to our Superintendent Maldonado. Thank you both Ms. Carey and Ms. Escobedo. We can go to our last slide. Um, so board members, this is just a revisit. This is our timeline. This is what we're looking at in terms of what we hope to see in the next couple of weeks. I'm so inspired by Dr. Fitzgibbon's uh, words of hope that we're going to get through this major search uh, continued words of hope around our academic, our, our learning, and our assessments of students and focus laser-like on our students and what they need to have from us during these moments. So with that, uh, President Ford, that concludes our presentation and we can take our PowerPoint off. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I, uh, I'm sure I'm joined by the board members in sharing my gratitude for the comprehensiveness of the report and, and, uh, and the preparedness of all of the present presenters, but also the sense of hope that we will get our students back to school. So with that, I'd like to move to public comment. I believe that we have four, uh, four folks who would like to make some comments and they will each have three minutes as we have always tried to offer in the past. And so I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Trujillo to call on our speakers. Thank you, President Ford, members of the board. Good evening. Um, yes, we have four uh, speakers for this item. Uh, I will name them four. Uh, Carolyn Hera, Karen McBride, Kimberly Tilton, and Aaron Solis. We'll start with Carolyn Hera. Ms. Caroline, can you hear us? Great, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, great, thank you. Ah, the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry, quoting, of course, Steinbeck, who reminds us that despite our highest hope, fate continues to conspire against us. I applaud you all for your commitment and many months of planning to find a way back to school, but I implore you today to reconsider your approach. 
The district's push to find fail-safe plans over the past 10 months have ultimately proven to be our greatest foe. It caused the district to lose precious time over the spring and summer, and then when infection rates changed, this forced a reset in planning. It was a tough lesson, but did we fully assimilate it? Unfortunately, the priority for fall became the plan, not the outcome. We heard metaphors of impossible chicken and egg scenarios relating to budgets and testing. Instead of expediting a push to get kids back to school when we could have, the district put all of its eggs in one basket, hoping for better days. Unfortunately, COVID will continue to prevent a return to school for most students this year. And yet here we are talking about plans and a grading policy. Instead of the priority being on student well-being, it's on whether or not students who are failing should get a passing mark. Respectfully, I think you're missing the point. Behind each failing grade is a student. Failing or not, most students are in crisis right now. But despite the strain they're experiencing, the district is now requiring longer school days, as long as 7.30 a.m. to 3.35 p.m. for learning over Zoom with shorter lunch. How do you think that will go? What about those students who work to support their families? The best laid plans often go awry. Today's plans will be challenged by COVID and by a looming mental health disaster. At what point do we scrap long range planning and begin to adapt to the crisis in front of us? The priority must be on mental health, not grades or maintaining status quo pre-COVID educational standards. The district must be nimble and creative. Individual schools are frankly better at understanding the unique needs of their communities. Empower them to implement more relevant and adaptable policies. We know distance learning is unlike traditional instruction. Past time to rethink the modes of teaching and allow greater flexibility so that teachers can be creative and students can minimize screen time. Administrators are also prohibited per union contract from telling teachers how to offer instruction. Help administrators help their teachers with the new normal. Finally, let's prioritize our seniors who have been burdened with the most challenging course load, testing and college application season. They have been all but forgotten. Should the district implement a grading policy? Sure, however, it won't solve the problems of the day. Let's rethink our approach, please, with a focus on mental wellness and intervention and begin to act today, one day at a time. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Karen McBride. Good evening, Chris. The board. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, hi. Um, I'm just going to keep my comments pretty brief. Um, I just wanted to, uh, well, actually, I want to start by, by saying that um, I had had intended to only speak about the grading policy tonight, but I want to respond to um, the fact that uh, Ms. Maldonado referred to uh, my attendance at a discussion with her and the CSCA president, Paul Rooney, about the Safe Schools Plan for All, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to begin that conversation with the district. Um, I want to say that in our first meeting, there were quite a few unanswered questions. So I look forward to continued conversations um, and uh, opportunities to ask further questions to help share our local version of the plan uh, or help shape our local version of the plan, I should say. So I just wanted to, to respond to that, but I want to move on to the, um, to the grading practices or the grading policy at hand tonight. Um, so uh, at the beginning of tonight, um, Ms. Maldonado talked about the, the sort of the four-pronged approach to student learning and, and grading. And one of the facets of that was how will we respond when students do not learn? Um, and, and I wanna say that I understand the need to respond in this situation where we have a lot of kids with um, Ds and Fs um, but I want to hearken back to the fact that, you know, we invited a guest speaker at the beginning of the year, Jeff Duncan Andrade, to come in and speak to our, our staff about connecting with students and um, really doing things to try and make a difference uh, during these very difficult times, which some often refer to as sort of a double pandemic. And I think that... Um, the grading policy as it stands and what was presented tonight, while it, it is well intended, it's missing. I think I would agree with um, uh, Ms. Hara that just spoke. It's, it's missing that piece where we need to look at what is behind a child who 
is getting a D or an F and what are we going to do about it besides just giving them more time that doesn't address the, the causes, the root causes. And, and maybe I missed something, but I haven't heard any discussion about that. Maybe it's forthcoming next week. I don't know, but I would ask the questions. What if any interventions will be offered to students to assist them in completing work and learning the material that they missed? And I want to um, add to that the fact that, especially in our high schools, we're going to have teachers starting entirely new courses with a whole set of new students on their rosters with the challenges that, that will be related to that. And with a carryover of students who are, are trying to to do recovery, it's going to provide some unique challenges and those students need assistance. They, they missed the material the first time around for whatever reason, for some variety of challenges. How are we going to address those? Um, and I also want to just- Time. Thank you, okay. sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kimberly Tilton. Um, Hi. Thank you to the board and uh, Ms. Maldonado and the administration. My name is Kim Tilton. I work at San Marcos High School and I'm a science teacher. You could say I'm at the heart of the DNF rate as I teach chemistry. <laughs> it doesn't matter what year it is. <laughs> We're kind of high flyers often. And it's something that I deeply think about far before COVID. And for people who have been in the profession for a long time, grading practices, they are a Pandora's box that need to be solved. And pedagogically, a lot of people are doing a lot of great things. So I agree with Sean Carey that it's a great goal for our district to move towards asset-based grading and standards-based grading, and I support it. My concern tonight is what's best for my students right now? And I think what's best for them is to have agency. There are many students that should have the choice to receive a D, if that's what's best for them. I have kids in my class who they did not pass physics their freshman year. They were placed into my class during COVID remote learning. And now they're, you know, D's or F's again. If they get an incomplete or a D non-credit, and then I set them up on a learning plan and theoretically somehow had an amazing amount of time to support them <laughs> and my incoming students. And they still don't get credit by the end of the semester. I'm looking at a junior who has only two years to pass two science classes to graduate. And I just, I'm here to say we should give students a choice and to change the grading policies on students and teachers last minute. We have to be really thoughtful about it and make sure that all options are on the table so that they can do what's best for them. I think the counselors are really the ones that know what this looks like for kids. And we should really be turning to them to ask them what they think is best. But that's one concern. I will say, I understand that these are not A through G for your university credit, but they kids can absolutely still go to college. They need to pass high school to get to city college. And I, I worry for my children. My second thought is the reasons they didn't pass my class a semester, they're not related to time. It's not like if I gave them two more months, they would suddenly pass. And without my direct supervision and support, it's very unlikely that many of them will. And so mm -hmm. I'd like to just know more about what does that look like? What support will we give them? How can the district help me? Because my whole thing this last Christmas break was asking myself, what more can I do for the kids next semester so that this doesn't happen to them? And so that's my second question is, how can you help me better understand what supports I can provide to help the kids who are going to get incompletes or non-credits? Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Our last speaker is Mr. Aaron Solis. Aaron, can you hear us? I'm right here. You got me? Yes, go ahead. All right. Thank you so much uh, to the board and everyone uh, for their hard work in such a unique time. Um, I'm going to try and wing this because my students are grading me on impromptu speaking. So I didn't prepare anything. I'm just I'm just going with it. And they got they've got a nice little assignment for them. Um, it was actually very shocking to hear about this through Newshawk first rather than from the, the district first. 
Um, I, it's taken me a while to kind of digest this and I still need to digest this, the grain policy some more. The intent behind this, I am all for it. Everything that was has been said, I, I agree with, um, but just the way this is being brought out and the timing of it is, is it just doesn't sit right with me that, that this has been put in page 27 of a, of a COVID report on a special meeting to be voted on next week. And for argument's sake, this is voted on next, next Tuesday. Now all of a sudden, teachers have two and a half days to swerve and adjust. And basically next Friday, not this Friday, the week after next Friday is the end of the race for a year long class for us. Cause remember everyone's on block schedule. This is the end, this is like June grades. The, the finish line is there and 10 feet before the finish line, we're moving, we're moving the finish line. And that affects students and that affects teachers. And it, it, it's just, it, it, it hurts actually that, that teachers have not been, have a seat at the table in this discussion. We have amazing frontline workers at Cottage Hospital working on this COVID thing. Please do not forget your frontline workers, the teachers who are developing these relationships with the kids each and every day in a very unique environment. And we have not been consulted. What is our opinion? Maybe we have good ideas to roll this out. You know, the, the timing of it, I just feel is, is not good. The elementary is gonna wait till the next grading period, but the secondary, we're gonna do it two and a half days before the year ends. And then we're gonna start a whole brand new year the following week. So thank you very much uh, for listening to me. And as I said, it's, it, it was just a shock to learn. And I really wish we would have been given more notification on this rather than one week before the board is gonna have a vote on it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And President Ford, that concludes public comment. Today. Thank you, Ms. Trujillo, and thank you to all of our speakers and all of the folks who have written us, educators, parents, and other concerned citizens about everything related to COVID-19, and especially uh, the proposed grading policy changes. Um, Ms. Maldonado, would you like to say anything before I turn it over to the board for questions and comments? Yes, um, first of all, thank you to our public comments. And there is some um, a week long set of activities we have for uh, getting input from many of our different stakeholders, our students, our teachers, our reentry task force, which includes parents and community partners as well. I do know that Ms. Carey has done some extensive outreach with some of our administrators, our deans, counselors, and APs. And uh, we know that we, we are considering the similar idea of moving the, um, as the last speaker said, the line uh, over to the policy in secondary being similar to elementary, which is to, go, to be going forward, not looking back. However, that does bring to mind the concern about what happens to those students who now have permanent records with Ds and Fs. And so we'll be uh, providing more information to all our teachers and, and principals and others and getting their feedback. But more, more of that to come and also to start to think about what can we offer as a district during the summer for extended learning, credit recovery and other opportunities. We know we cannot extend the day longer than we already have. And uh, having two sons that are completing college uh, myself, I know how hard it is for our college applications. These are not necessarily looked at favorably, whether it's community college or uh, UCCSU uh, University. So all of those factors are top of mind for us, especially as we think about our seniors um, who so badly need to have um, these opportunities to show their mastery of learning in a different way, which is what this pandemic has shown us. Thank you. So with that, it's time to move to board questions and comments. And so I'd like to start with Ms. Munoz. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, 
Um, yes, I guess, you know, I am concerned about, you know, like everyone about our most vulnerable students. And as you know, Ms. Maldonado said, the uh, high school students and the impact of the grades, you know, of course, we're concerned right now with um, the mental health, you know, the impact of all this on our youth and their families and their self-esteem. Um, so anything that can make it more, um, you know, more doable is helpful in, in terms of the, the grades for high school students, would it be, you know, are we looking at, so, so I'm trying to understand, make sure I understand it correctly. Like, so we would be looking at the past, um, you know, the past semester or, or going forward. I was trying to figure that part out. I'll, I'll jump in. So uh, we're talking about a marking period that ends next week. The semester for secondary schools end on, ends on Friday, January 15th. The grading window opens two days before that, so teachers can begin to enter grades. And we propose extending the closing of that window through the end of the month, because the intent of this policy is to provide a compassionate alternative for flexibility for students and staff in a way that is reasonable. And we recognize that that takes a little bit more time um, to do something differently than you've done it before. So it would be for this marking period, which is this semester. It's not about being applied retroactively to what we would call the term one grades for high schools. And that was the end of October. Okay. And, and the, um, well, two things. One is of course, you know, the teachers are concerned about, you know, what they would be doing their role in the future. Um, for trying to help the students pass, right? And from what I'm hearing, there's gonna be support for that, right, for for them? Yes, so I think what I'll offer, and I, I hear and understand that concerning question, it's a very layered response. Um, one, and in a way it, it is the opportunity also to speak to the point about root causes. There are varying circumstances, both on the student end and on, on, the, on the teacher end, for why a student might be having a D or an F, um, valid varying circumstances. And so when we have a policy, which is a very high level framing document, what it sacrifices is those conversations that yield a better understanding about what in this case is causing a student to be having a D or an F. What in this case is causing a teacher to have a high incidence of Ds and Fs? We, you know, we hear about differences across subject matters we know that that's true from our data analysis. And so those kinds of conversations need to play out at the level of the classroom, at the level of a teacher's PLC or department, and sometimes with the faculty as a whole. And so in a case where we're, we're talking about um, a high number of students who may need an alternate form of a mark on a report card in the form of an incomplete or no credit, we would want lots of support to come to that classroom teacher from site administration based on guidance that we provide from the district office to help guide those conversations about what the best approaches would be. The intent is not to create an onerous burden for teachers or for students. It's a, we don't want to overburden students who will have their current coursework at the same time they may be having missing learning to recover from first and second term. So these have to be thoughtful responses. And again, it's in the application of the, pro of the policy, um, not so much just a rigid, a rigid laying out execution of the policy literally, literally as it's written. Those are the par parameters um, and the, yeah, the, param the just the parameters and sort of the guidance. Okay, I, so, I appreciate that. That helps because, okay. you know, students that feel overwhelmed or if they're, you know, of course, like as the, um, the speaker said in the letters that we got, you know, in terms of like a science class versus a class that a student's like, okay, I'm, I'm fine with this, you know, with just passing um, and mm -hmm. such. So that helps. Thank you. Sure. Can I just add a little bit to the, this idea that we as a system need to have a response ready 
set of protocols in place. So if a student is receiving lots of these NFs, when do we hold our student study team meetings that are part of our multi-tiered system of support? So it's not just at the, at the one per class, at one teacher level, it's at the whole view of the whole child and how does the whole system provide tier one, tier two, and tier three opportunities to succeed and supports that are needed. And that includes, uh, as in the elementary policy, the needed conversations that include the parents, the teachers, the students, administrators at the school site, who are all coming together to do a study around how can we best help this student achieve high rates of success and if they are struggling in a particular area, then what more can we do for the student? Because we shouldn't just stop at, okay, well, you got an F, sorry, next class. It really needs to be a more comprehensive system of support that we are now trying to push forward as part of our significant disproportionality findings, which the board heard about several months back as well. Right, excellent. Yes, because, you know, what else is going on? The counseling, you know, kids being cooped up, you know, um, and, and the social isolation, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Munoz. On to Ms. Sims Moten. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much everyone for your presentations. Very comprehensive tonight. And I know Dr. Fitzgibbons had to leave, but always uh, appreciate her uh, coming in and giving us an update. Um, so I just have a couple questions on both topics that we um, were presented on tonight. Uh, let me first start with, with, with this grading policy. So much like the last time we were trying to make a decision and it seemed a quick decision with regards to whether we're gonna do credits or no credits and how we were gonna balance people wanting letter grades versus you know credits versus no credits. It comes down to me, it seems like at least from the frontline teachers or at least the comments that we're having that they have, they're have, they not part of the conversation or they're not part of that. And I don't know if there's a breakdown in communication with regards to it's being discussed at the administrative level, then the principals and that level, then where does it get to the teachers? Because looking at, reading a lot of the letters, that's kind of been um, the common thread of I didn't know, it's going on, it's too fast. so. That's just my reading on that, and 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 Miss um, Maldonado, you can to speak to that in, in just a moment. But that was concerning to me that it never seems to get to that level. But I don't know where the breakdown in communication is with with regards to that. So just to think about that, and then secondly, when we talk about the system, so where you were talking about the using the system to address. Um, the needs of the children who are getting D's and F's as a whole, as our SST teams, that's not new, right? So is there a different approach using that approach, but are there different strategies that we're using to better address the needs of the students? So it, it, can you, someone respond to that or? So thank you, uh, Ms. Sims Moulton. The For the first part of your question, you know, our, our principals do have meetings with teachers SLT meetings, PLCs and such, where we often look at and talk about student outcomes and progress and planning and so forth. So I am not in a position, I would be a liar if I said to you, every single principal has done this with every single teacher. Uh, it is uh, concerning to me, of course, when, and and I, I completely agree with the teachers. If they read an article uh, in the newspaper that says this is a hidden agenda item, which was not at all an intended outcome of how we prepared ourselves uh, during the winter break for this meeting, uh, I would be concerned too if I was a teacher. So I, I gotta give it to the teachers and I uh, definitely uh, need to let you know that we have a teacher advisory group with which we met with this afternoon uh, that's giving us feedback. We had a lot of support from that group, some concerns on the details because you know, some of us are like, let's go, let's do this, uh, take us on this journey. And then some of us are like, who, what, when, where, why, how? And we need to address all those things. So those are forthcoming issues. In the order of business, we also didn't want to get ahead of the board and, and start to talk about a, a potential policy change without even having the board's blessing and then find ourselves in another situation where we're now having to retract and say, actually, no, we're not going to change the policy. Forget everything we just told you about. So. 
it's one of those situations where we are being as agile, agile and as quick as possible. Um, as far as your second question, I already forgot it because I was so busy answering the first one. Um, could you repeat that second part? Sure, it was the, um, the SST teams. That's something that we currently have in place anyway, but I was just wondering, is there a different approach that we'll be using based on the data that coming through COVID now? Can we do it better? Are there new strategies that we're gonna use to enhance that SST team strategy that we already have in place? Absolutely, that is the learning of the system in Santa Barbara Unified. As you know, when I got here, Several months ago, we, we learned about this uh, continued significant disproportionality of over-identifying students in special ed. So you almost have a system where you have general ed or special ed and nothing in between. So where is that middle ground, that tier two? And that is where we want to take our teachers and our administrators to having these conversations about what's the in-between. There are ways to, uh, Anna did a great job of reporting to you that we don't have a report card that reflects, reflects the ELD standards. So how do parents of English learners know what kind of progress our children are making towards English language proficiency if our standard doesn't, if our report cards don't cover that? When do teachers grade our students in ELD in elementary as an example? So there are some um, areas of growth. Our significant disproportionality plan speaks to that. And um, we have, provided and will continue to provide our teachers with opportunities to continue to learn in a kind, compassionate way in phases. But in the meantime, we also have a, a, a quick response that we need to have for our students. So all of that is you know, being built upon as we, as we speak. Yeah, so thank you, thank you for that because as we have our systems, how does it also not only meet this moment, but how does it meet the future moments with regards to this, you know, in our learning? Um, and, 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 and to add on to um, Ms. Minos, Ms. Minos, with, with regards to the mental health, we talked about that last meeting, how important that is, uh, making sure that we don't lose the human behind all the things that we're trying to do because we're still trying to meet this moment as well as trying to balance it between meeting for the future needs with regards to that. So I appreciate, uh, I think both um, Ms. Carey and um, uh, Ms. Escobedo uh, <laughs> said in, in their comments, it just did too many mains flying in that brain tonight. And then my, my next question, and I was just trying to understand in the safe for all, um, when the governor talked about that, you know, if in our county, our rates are fine, we can, you know, we get back to school or whatever, but how does that then, um, meet with as because we're in a region at the larger region do those 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 rates seem to come in conflict so if as a county we're doing well but as as part of the region we're not how does that then impact our ability to get our students back in school or does it i'll ask miss susan that's an excellent question miss moan so what's happened is that we are in a region in terms of ICU beds and availability and a stay at home order. In terms of the safe schools for all pro plan, it is by individual county. So our individual county, as we get our rates, our case rates down, we will be able to move forward meeting the governor and the state's guidance about having a safety plan, about having the things in place that increase testing, the increased accountability, we will be able to move with the governor's new plan, even though we're in the region that is larger than our own county. Okay, thank you. Because I was really confused. I was thinking, well, it seems like they're going to be in conflict of each other with regards to here's a rate we can, you know, that dictates stay at home. And then also there's a rate with regards to us being able to get back under this new initiative. And then uh, one more, one last question I had with regards to you know, the vaccination. So we, we were saying that kids are not contracting it. You know, it's mostly in the community. It's not in our schools. It's in the community. And so how are we then addressing getting the, the community vaccinated so that we're reducing that rate, you know, because the kids are not getting it at school, but they may be being, you know, uh, being, a tr you know, being um, infected by the community because the rates are increasing there and it's in the community at a higher la level, as Dr. Fitzgibbon said. So how are we using the vaccination? I know we're using our frontline workers and certainly the most priority needs to be there, but if it's in the community, how are we taking care of that part? 
It's an excellent point. The more COVID there is in our community, the more risk it is for all of us, students, staff, adults, everyone in our community. So we all want to get that rate down. We are continuing to work on things to use our masks, face coverings, all the steps we're talking about. At the same time, we're working forward to the vaccination. The governor does have a vaccination work group that's coming out with priorities. I understand that there will probably be a presentation of this later this week, but some initial um, plans were put forward. The phase 1A are the current people getting vaccinated. Those are healthcare workers, people who work directly with people who have COVID, and people in long-term care residents. Those are people with the highest rate of severe illness and death. 1B, that's the next phase. It has a tier one and a tier two. In tier one, are people over the age of 75, people, employees in education and in childcare. So your um, representation, people who work in schools, school staff are right in the next phase. And our county is right now planning and beginning to work on logistics. It will be a huge monumental effort. I don't wanna underestimate this. We're talking about large numbers of people we're talking about two doses for each person at certain intervals, and we need to get people vaccinated quickly, more timely. We need to have the vaccine here. We need to have the vaccine kept in the storage the way it needs to be. I want you to know that our local health department is already planning and working on those logistical issues now. So I'm happy that people in education, childcare are in the next phase. And as soon as we know more about that, we will certainly share. Okay, much appreciated. Thank you again. Uh, thank you, um, President Ford. Those are my questions. Thank you, Ms. sims Moten. Ms. Caps. Thank you so much. There's a lot to unpack here. I'm going to take it kind of in reverse order to stay on the grading policy first, but then go back to the beginning of the presentation. Um, again, uh, thanks all around to this uh, comprehensive conversation. On the grading, um, I have three questions. Uh, the first is just on process and, and Superintendent Maldonado, you've, you've addressed this, but I just want to convey my um, preference, understanding that good intentions all around were here, especially to bring something to the board. But I do really uh, lament the teachers that, you know, read about this in News Hawk. And so I was just say as a board member, it's, I appreciate you coming to the board because that when you come to the board, that means coming to the public <laughs> and there's great transparency there. But I, as a board member would like to know that the stakeholders have been consulted prior. So that's my preference going forward. And I know that that's the next step. And so with that process, I would just ask um, for some considerations. Um, on this point about Ds, um, I, I heard, we heard this from a handful of teachers about, uh, of course, understanding that nobody wants to give a student a D, um, but, but not having credit for that D, what that would do for so many students who aren't necessarily going on to college, but are, are trying to graduate. I just would hope that we can understand a little bit more there about the implications and what num like what numbers we're talking about because we did hear that repeatedly from teachers. So that's uh, sort of more of a, I think you've addressed it already and, and Ms. Carey, you've addressed it in an email. You're welcome to speak to it now, but really I just would hope that when we bring this back, uh, we can have more of a conversation with teachers on that so that there's consensus, um, if that's okay. And then also just uh, what Ms. Tilton, the chemistry teacher from San Marcos said so eloquently about the, you know, it, it seems as though when you're just seeing this in a proposal, I know it's not the case, um, that the interventions are all on the teachers, right? <laughs> that if, if they have to now give uh, um, incompletes, that it's all on them to spend more time with more students on top of the new students that they're getting. So if perhaps um, in this pro policy proposal, um, you could list the other interventions so that the public and the board and parents and teachers and of course students understand what's at stake with an incomplete, what's at stake with a non-credit. You know, of course, I know you know it and I know that this is all based in compassion and I wanted, I should have said that from the front because it's very clear that this is about understanding where we are in this point in history and what pressures our students are under on an hourly basis. But 
the way that when you, you know, when you just read this at face value without getting into the depth of it, the, the interventions that are so incredibly needed are all the, the teachers bear the brunt of all of it. Um, again, I, that's not the case, but if you could come back to us with uh, more concrete answers about what, and I know Ms. Alvarez asked about this at our last meeting, what's actually happening in a way that um, hopefully teachers, everybody's on board with. Um, and again, I just, I hear you that this is a case by case uh, situation for each student. And I think um, Ms. Hera spoke to the mental health. Um, I know that, I, I guess, um, I just want to bring up uh, what's happening uh, in our community with the two students whose lives were tragically lost. We just have so much incredible pressure um, upon all of us and to welcome in this new year, trying to be hopeful, and then to have this happen on in the east side, but not just the east side, to all of to our entire school community. Um, and I know that uh, Councilwoman Alejandra Gutierrez spoke about the domino effect of uh, what happened with this senseless shooting uh, and the kids that actually saw the response to it. So I just put that in context because what you all are doing and what we're doing is really a tough balancing act because here we are saying, all of this new information is coming in. We learned in December about the increased rate of 10% of Ds and Fs. Yet, so we wanna change policy, but now it's like, oh, this is too, too fast. So it's, it's really trying to find a tough balance of being extremely agile, but also understanding that people need to be brought along and the extreme pressures. So I just urge you to try to find that, <laughs> that balance. Uh, and we're here to support as we can. The community is here to support as we can. So I ended up just not really asking three questions, but bringing up three topics on the grading policy. Um, if you do come back and say uh, this, this, as much as we, wanted to do this, it doesn't make sense for this time. I think I'd understand that, but I'm also very much open to this happening if we can um, so quickly, because I understand those two pressures. Um, so that's really a tough week ahead of you, but I hope that you'll do the work and I know you will um, to make sure that you come back with a, a policy proposal for the board that's really supported by the stakeholders who that'll impact. Um, with that, I wanna move uh, back into the presentation um, for Ms. Uh, Klein Rothschild on the dashboard and the vaccines. I'm wondering if you have an understanding um, if our dashboard will soon include our vaccinations rates. I have limited information about the dashboard. I can tell you what I do know. Okay. I understand there will be a dashboard that allows all school information to be entered and to be visible. I do not yet know about the vaccination information if that will be on the dashboard. My understanding was the dashboard would be more about COVID case rates rather than vaccination. At this point, we need to learn more from the governor. Thank you. And I guess, um, I was, we were all, I think, taken by every time Dr. Fitzgibbon speaks. I mean, she just uh, doesn't sugarcoat, but gives us hope. And that's a hard thing to do right now. But uh, the hope really is about the vaccines. And so similar to the uh, engineers that we heard from, there's so much community willingness to help. <laughs> so I just, I know this is not necessarily your job, um, but if there is any way with the logistics, I mean, we have Amazon, headquarters here, if there's a way that the, the community can help, because my goal is for teachers to be vaccinated uh, as soon as possible and staff, school staff to be vaccinated. I know we all share that goal, but I think we have to keep saying it. Uh, even though we heard tonight that Dr. from Dr. Fitzgibbons that the vaccines are going well, the headlines everywhere else say otherwise. And so if, if, if I can convey this again, that if there's a way in which the logistics can be supported by the community, uh, I know we want that because I do believe that first and foremost, 
you know, getting our teachers and our staff vaccinated so that we can get kids back in school most, most safely um, is such a goal for us all. So I just wanted to say that publicly and, and follow up with any kind of offer I can possibly um, do in this arena. Um, I will take that back for sure. Thank you. And I mentioned, um, I don't know if Dr. Sigelman and Dr. Squire are still on, uh, but I just wanted to thank them. What wonderful uh, contribution to come forward as parents, chemical engineers to help. And I read that when I saw the, uh, in the agenda, that study, and I just thought this is, this is what we've been craving. Parents have been asking for this kind of ventilation study. So I'm hopeful, um, Superintendent Maldonado, uh, that this kind of ACH study could be done for every classroom. I know that's a big undertaking. I think we have somewhere in the ballpark of 800 classrooms. Um, but I just, now that we know that we can, and it's been done at Dos Pueblos and soon will be done at Adams, um, I don't know what kind of support if the governor, the, this new funding can support um, that kind of study, but certainly I as a mom would be feel much more comfortable knowing um, what ACH rate uh, my son's classroom had. So if, if that could be something that you're thinking about, I certainly would be all in support of, and I'd love to hear more um, if you're able to answer that now, kind of the next steps with this, uh, with this new information. So I'm gonna ask Rachel to even give me a sense of if that's even feasible. Or what would it take? Right. So I, we have on order eight or nine monitors. And we'd like to do a couple of spots in every classroom just because there is some concern about stagnant points. So we can't, we can't do a whole lot at a time right now. Um, but I will also say that I'm not sure we need to measure every classroom. When we started looking at classrooms, we realized that the architecture of a lot of the rooms is very, very similar in any given school. And so what we need to do is to measure a typical classroom and then go and measure all of the outliers and all of the rooms that would cause us any concern. But I'm not sure every classroom is actually where we need to be. But we do need the facilities people absolutely, and they're doing a great job right now of identifying all the classrooms that are outliers and that are unusual in some way. That's it. Did you want to add something, Todd? Uh, no, I, mean, I think Rachel really hit it on the head there. Um, you know, this is, I mean, this is not Rachel's and my primary job. Right. I mean, Rachel is the chair of the chemical engineering department and, uh, um, you know, it is something that can be contracted out as well. And I'm not sure what the rates are, but, but like Rachel says, I don't know that you absolutely need to do it. You tend to see patterns, you know, and when, when you see rooms that have the same basic architecture, you know, you, you start to see the same kinds of behavior. And so that's, that's what we look for. Um, it is a really great point, though, that there are people that can contract, you can contract to do this. Absolutely. And I didn't mean to suggest at all. You've done such an amazing, you've given <laughs> such a gift to our entire school district already. So thank you for that and for, to making the point that not every classroom would need to be made uh, to have the study conducted, but rather the uh, the type of, of, of structure of the class. So I understand that. But I'm just saying that I would, again, I just think this should be part of our preparation is to understand um, the ventilation. I think, uh, board, uh, Ms. Caps, I almost called you board president, uh, is that the big learning for us and for Steve and, and his team is this idea that having a fan, it's a, a simple answer that they gave us, having a fan that kind of pulls out the air, uh, there's no reason why we couldn't do it in every classroom just to sort of help out this process. And just it, it's just really made us a lot smarter about the way we think about approaching this idea of ventilation, but this the Swiss cheese, right? This layering yeah. of supports and, and things that we can do is giving us all of that confidence that we can say to our, our parents, our students and our teachers that we're putting in place every single layer of protection that we can. And I think that's the, the, the big outcome for me as a superintendent and for the team that we're working with to try to lead in this area. Yeah, I, and even, oh. Oh no, I, I was just gonna to chime in. I'm sorry to, to interrupt, um, but, uh, I find it reassuring that it's actually measurable, right? You can actually, you can put a fan somewhere and you can measure the impact of it, right? So we all know six feet or, you know, there's there's things, you know, how often do you wipe down a surface? How far away do you put desks, et cetera, you know? But, but this is something that you can actually, in terms of ventilation, which 
only recently has you know CDC and WHO really acknowledged it's important uh, for indoor spaces. Um, you know, there's a real way to test how how well are our strategies working, and and to me, that's that's the real benefit. I agree, and I just add about the um, the HEPA filters and. Um, Dr. Sigelman, you mentioned, you know, Thomas Fire. Like I have, I, I have two that I would be thrilled to donate if that's what we need, right? So I think that that again, hopefully, that's in your planning with uh, Mr. Vizzolini as well of how classrooms. I mean, just the impact of having a HEPA filter and the need there. If we can, uh, if we need support from the community, I think that that's a very tangible thing to ask for. Um, I certainly would love to remind to be in a classroom rather than, you know, in my in my garage right now, right? So uh, thank you to both of you. And I just I, I, what you've provided is extremely valuable, valuable because it's so tangible um, in this very scary uh, world that we live in. And so I'll be really quick. I do have two more questions. Um, one, we got a, this is for Dr. Wagonick. We got a note from um, a parent today about um, athletics cohorts being canceled. I think I understood you that that's not true, but can you just confirm? Um, athletic cohorts are not canceled. Um, we are looking at the, the current COVID rates to make decisions on whether small cohorts and athletic um, practices will resume next week um, or the week after. But no, they are not canceled. Thank you. And lastly, uh, the first the first slide uh, mentioned the survey happening with parents. Um, Superintendent Maldonado, are you able to say anything more about that at this point? Because I know there's been a lot of anxiety about these surveys. So are you able to elaborate at this point? Yeah, the, the issue of living in paradox is <laughs> my new reality for all things, right? Grading and um, opening schools. So we do intend to send a survey out to all our elementary school parents. We have the results of what they want for their children in the red or better whether it was hybrid or distance learning. So I think um, the team is putting together some language to uh, re-survey our parents to now say this new guidance from Governor Newsom allows us to open schools. Once we hit the 28 or less ca uh, case rates cases per 100,000 residents and ask them to re-select. Are you comfortable still with uh, the in-person selection, or would you prefer distance learning? So that will be going out in the coming days. We're just tightening up the language on that. I feel confident that as soon as we reach that level, everything else is in place from our end to go ahead and um, reopen. So yes, we will resurvey parents working on that language and will be coming in the next couple of days. And I'll just speak from experience. I know that when these surveys go out that the principals get a ton of questions about them. So uh, I know you know that, but just to to make the point, if principals can be uh, given a heads up or involved in some of the interpretation, because again, I know uh, the challenge of putting something succinctly, but also ascertaining really good information. So Thank you. Thank, this is a lot to pack in. I'm so grateful we had this meeting tonight uh, and thanks to everyone involved. Thank you, President Ford. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Alvarez. Thank you and good evening everyone. And thank you to all of our guest experts. Um, I have a, a few questions and uh, I'll start with the first with the report on the safety opening of schools. I like to focus a little bit on the progress that we have made. The progress that we have made as a community and like Susan Klein Rothschild mentioned, we know more now than we did back in March. And where does that place us? Well, bringing it home, bringing it to Santa Barbara Unified, there's a lot of preparation that has been made as uh, Ms. Maldonado mentioned, as soon as that template is ready, we will be submitting that information to the state. Also, the governor has promised funding 
along with the mandates. So that's good news. Potentially, we could receive about $5.8 million if this proposal is approved. And I'm very happy to hear that this money, that we are thinking that this money will be dedicated to support learning opportunities for our students, including possibly some summer programs. We have a lot, work to, a lot of work to do as a community. And I ask the 300 people online right now to please continue doing your part. Wash your hands, wear your mask, avoid gatherings, tell your friends, tell your family, we can do this. We can flatten the curve. There's about 26 miles in a marathon. We're about in the 23rd mile. We're not going to quit. We are going to go to the finish line, but we have to do it together. So thank you. And now I do have some questions about the grading policy. I do understand and I appreciate the intent behind it and the compassion and I thank you for that. And I hear three things, I hear three things, themes and I thank all the teachers that wrote to us. I really appreciate your time and you expressing your concerns. And uh, the three things that I hear is that we have two choices. One choice would be to keep doing what we're doing. And it's not a good system because it gives the students a permanent record of a D or an F for circumstances that, they're, that are beyond their control. The other choice might be that they receive an incomplete, but then that creates other concerns because now the teachers, as we heard, the semester ends and who's going to monitor that work that came to the incomplete. So that's a concern. My question is, what's the common interest? The common interest is that we all want the students to do well. Is there a third choice? Is there a third choice that we're not thinking about? Perhaps there could be that we do give the students additional time but take this burden away from the teachers because they're already moving forward to their new classes, their new students. And perhaps we can devote some funding so that we can have a teacher on special assignment at each school. I'm thinking out loud here, but someone that supports the students so that it's not an additional burden to the teachers. I'm also, I also want to acknowledge and agree with my colleague board members as far as the process. I think this is an area of growth and I want us to do better. I want to make sure that the teachers are part of the conversation, that the teachers are part, have a seat on the table and that we are building bridges with the teachers, the frontline workers that their input is taken into consideration. And maybe we're already doing that, but I, I like to see that increased so that everybody's voice is heard. And the other question that I have or comment is, I'd like to hear a little bit more about the interventions that are in place. I'd like to hear more about the root cause of the problem of the students that are in this situation. I really appreciate what uh, Ms. Tilton said in regards to what support systems will be available to the students and the teachers. And I like us to think about that. And please remind me what support systems do we have in place? And we as a board, how can we support you, our administrative team so that we can enhance those supports? Thank you for that, uh, Board Member Alvarez, uh, for your comments and for this excellent breakdown of, you know, what are the choices and is there a third choice? I do hear loud and clear the concerns around the process and I want to assure the board that we have uh, places where we can grow. And uh, in this case, our intentionality around uh, getting a answer to the other side of the conversation from the student's perspective drove our decision-making. But of course, bringing the teachers along 
ensuring that everybody feels supported uh, seems to be the topic and the theme that we will take back as an executive cabinet team and drill down to ensure that we do better. And that uh, there, the teachers that we heard from are some, but I know that we have also in our conversation today with the advisory group, heard a lot of teachers who also support this move, uh, which you didn't, you didn't all, including myself here from uh, in your email. So I wanna make sure that I represent well the fact that there are many sides to this conversation. And sometimes we don't always hear from those who are supportive. Uh, and, and that's not to, to be defensive, but just more to ensure that you know, we are uh, hearing you loud and clear and that the process was the biggest concern on day two of 2021 semester of our school in an uh, unusual uh, academic year. Uh, then as far as uh, this third option, we, uh, we definitely know that we also have some substitute teachers, but in the more specialized classes, we also know that that requires a special credential and looking at how that might work is an issue that we have to consider on a, on a school by school, case by case basis. Um, in elementary, it'll be easier because we're multi-subject credential teachers, not so much so in the secondary space. So I'll look at Ms. Sean Carey, I know you turned on your camera, so I believe you have additional comments as well. I just, yeah, I wanna be available to just uh, affirm that it's also our preference to always have stakeholder engagement uh, prior to bringing a proposal. I appreciate the tension that was pointed out by Ms. Caps about the urgency on the one hand of meeting the need and the importance of making sure we're meeting a need in a way that demonstrates integrity and, and high quality. So um, I wanted to also highlight that when I, uh, if you look back at the principles that are guiding the distance learning grading practices, and there were the four principles about sensitivity and flexibility, about it being based on learning, about there being a variety of methods to inform grading and about it being asset oriented. Lots of those principles are derived from the work of last spring where we also explored validity of grades, reliability of grades, inherent inequities in our traditional grading systems. And we had robust uh, teacher uh, involvement and su support throughout the, the weeks. They were intensive weeks, but the weeks that we were debating that proposed policy as well. So in a way, this proposal stands on the shoulders of the experiences of last spring, although we did have to, as others have pointed out, act swiftly between our findings about the data, which we reported at the last board meeting, and what we need to do urgently about that at the level of policy, given the end of the first semester, um, a week from Friday. But I absolutely agree that a policy will only be as effective, again, as its implementation, and it's our teachers who will be implementing it. I want to make sure that everyone's clear that at the end of the day, and by ed code, a grade assigned is teachers have the right of, of assignment of grades. And so this policy is meant to be a tool in their hands, not something that creates an, an onerous burden. Um, and that's at that level of conversation for the varying circumstances so that there can be support for teachers and for students as we think about the implementation. Um, and, and that hopefully is what is going to be further developed in the conversations throughout the days ahead. Um, I do also appreciate the suggestion of the, of the third choice. The key here is uh, options and flexibilities, especially because the needs are so varying and specific also in secondary with the credentialing matter that Superintendent Maldonado brought up. Um, so we will be exploring what some of those more creative options might look like. But again, it's not to have teachers teach their, their current rosters and then a good portion also of their prior semester rosters. That is not the vision. The vision is to think about those students who are, who are really earnestly engaging with learning and to actually push the conversation of, you know, let's not think about this in a way of it being, well, here's these 30 missing assignments, you know, from math or from history, but what are the essential things that we, we know should be learned in, the, in, in world history? And how can I give you an opportunity to demonstrate that? through a performance task or a kind of assessment because, because that's where you are and you should earn credit and you, that should be a C in the lens of the pandemic. So it's about that conversation where it's an appropriate one to have. It's not about having teachers serve their students currently on their roster while they simultaneously serve a large number of students from their, from their prior semester. 
I do also hear the, the request about learning supports and we can seek some further guidance, right? Superintendent, Superintendent Maldonado about how to bring that information forward. We will bring that back in our presentation next Thank Tuesday. You. Thank you. Uh, just a few more comments from me. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you again to everyone. And also I should say thank you to the almost 300 people who, have, who are sticking with us tonight. I'm so uh, cheered by knowing that people really care about uh, the challenges we're facing. And despite the fact that we may not all agree about solutions, everyone is seeking solutions. Um, Susan, I'm wondering if you could, uh, if you have any additional information about what the oversight might look like. It sounds so daunting to me that the that <laughs> Governor Newsom said that now we'll have greater oversight of these uh, school safety plans. Has any uh, have any details been shared about that? Thanks for asking the question. My understanding is that there have been some concerns in some communities across the state that there may be school districts who have plans, who said this is our prevention plan, but there's no oversight to say, are they following their own plan? Right. Where do complaints go? Uh, how do we know that, that this is valid? I can tell you in Santa Barbara County, if there's a concern by anyone in the community, they can put it on the public health website. They can make a phone call. Any concerns about any school or any childcare setting come to me and I have personal contact with the superintendent or principal of the school to follow up on those. But I'm understanding that's not consistent across the state. Thus, they wanted to have the hotline so anyone can make a complaint or make a concern and know that it'd be followed up on. They wanted the transparency of the data for all school districts. Um, they have the work group with experts at the state so those are the pieces I know. My sense from what I've heard is that the concern was that not in terms of our specific county, because we have a, a mechanism in place, but some counties do not have any mechanism. And we want consistency and we want safety across the state. Thank you so much for clarifying that. I also wanted to say that I'm really excited about the effort to address ventilation to keep kids and teachers safe. And I'm so happy also that the solutions don't sound expensive. So thank you so much to Todd and to Rachel for um, giving us great hope on that. It's a win-win on every level. And I really like the MacGyver approach to sort of outfitting box fans um, with HEPA filters and making it even better. So thank you so much. Um, I also wanted to mention that I noticed that uh, we're, uh, we are going back to school visitations to make sure that everyone is ready. And I know that the district has created several really great videos over the past few months. And with these school visitations happening again, I wonder if there might be an opportunity just to consider, and no, no need for an answer now, a, a way to sort of, in a video, take a visitor through the actual visitation process, which we all know leads to uh, it, up to including the outside socially distanced conversation with the staff, because I think it's a really great process and it might be helpful for everyone to be able to see something like that. Just something for you to consider. And then with regard to the, to <laughs> the grading policy, I, I feel like as a board, we should also take responsibility for, for this terrible push pull that everyone is feeling of urgency versus uh, taking time with process because we made it clear at the last board meeting that the number of D's and F's were not acceptable. And especially the disproportionality that exists in this district. And so I just want to reiterate my commitment and I know it's the board's commitment to make sure that not only is our goal this year to get kids back to school but also to create a, an instructional program and schools where equity is the focus. And uh, at this point, I, I really am very interested in what a change in grading will do for equity in particular. And as I mentioned to Josh Molina yesterday when he talked to me that um, most teachers I know, and we heard about it today also, they're already adjusting their practices. They're encouraging revisions. They're, they're stretching deadlines. They're providing extra uh, tutoring and they are focusing on competency-based uh, 
grading, but I think that changing board policies only acknowledge these changes and give them maybe strength and, um, and uh, provide a way forward. So I, I have one question um, before I just make one comment, and that is, uh, Ms. Carey, I'm concerned about number two of the prop, prop, uh, policy for secondary. If there's some sort of guarantee that a teacher is going to be responsible to ensure that all incompletes become C's, I'm wondering honestly why teachers would actually give incompletes and instead would just work dig diligently with students to help them meet the standards and then give everyone a C or better. I think that's an excellent question, President Ford. <laughs> uh, I'll use it to note that nowhere does this policy say that a 59.5% is equivalent to a D, which is synonymous with credit or passing a class. It's a construct that we're used to using right. often in secondary, but it's not stipulated by this policy. So this policy is really meant to push the thinking in exactly the direction that you just posed with your question. Great. What is essential that this student demonstrate in terms of essential learning for this course to have earned a passing grade? And it is the responsibility of both the teacher and also the student. Also, nowhere is this policy intending to exonerate for the student the important responsibility of being able to demonstrate learning. Hence the part about the balance between not compromising the rigor of learning at a high level of depth of knowledge, even as we seek to hold harmless. So incomplete contracts are meant to be a kind of agreement where it pushes the conversation to identify key learning um, for the clarity of both the student and the teacher who ultimately it's the student who demonstrates and takes responsibility for demonstrating that learning is the teacher who helps to facilitate clarity about what that must be for the passing grade to be earned. Right, thank you. Um, also, I, I guess I just have some cautionary notes here. I, I do want to, to strongly ask the board to reconsider the timeline and to consider um, what you will learn from Ms. Maldonado. I believe that you have a number of meetings planned for the next few days and you will get feedback and consider that feedback very seriously as we go forward. I also wanna remind all of us that policy is separate from an action plan. And so it will be helpful that not only do you reconsider timelines, but you um, create a the policy that a board can get behind and then perhaps as been, has been suggested by a number of board members that you also give us an idea about an action plan and timelines and interventions and supports and people responsible for that so that the public, teachers and the board have a, have a better idea about the actual potential for success of any policy that we approve. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, and we can definitely bring that to the board next Tuesday. I, I think that would be really helpful. Um, so I, I don't have any other specific questions, just, um, just that strong cautionary note that I, I know that many teachers have an issue about the, the, the speed with which we're approaching this and I want us to listen very carefully to them and I also want to underscore the reality that many, many teachers have already modified what they're doing and they have the same goals as the board does. Ms. Maldonado, do you have any further comments that you'd like to make before I close the meeting? Yes, well, thank you for that. And we, I think we, I just wanna summarize, we will continue to uh, conduct our stakeholder feedback meetings that are already in place. We will compile that feedback, bring back to the board next Tuesday, along with our action plans, a timeline, and our, our supports that will be made available so that students are at the center of our decision-making. Um, I do want to just say that there is a little bit of some feeling of uh, counterintuitiveness to changing a policy in grading 
in uh, the middle of this you know, school year at uh, speed of urgency. I do want to assure the teachers, the public, the board that we, are, we hold students at the center of our decision making. That, that is who we serve. And by no means does that mean we don't serve the teachers as well and that we won't be ready to support um, some of the concerns that they're bringing to us, both in the emails that you have received, as well as some of the um, sessions and meetings that we will continue to be having with them. And this is a long haul effort. This is not just uh, meant to end at the end of the pandemic. It's not meant to uh, change back to business as usual. It's really uh, pushing us forward to the 21st century uh, learning and 21st century learners that we serve. So I appreciate the board's thoughts and ideas that we've gotten tonight. I also wanna to thank Todd, Rachel, Susan, Dr. Fitzgibbons and all the other experts with us tonight, our brand new ASL translators who have now joined us and we figured out how to have them uh, be part of our meetings. And um, with that, thank you board. And we will see you in exactly seven days. Thank you, Ms. Maldonado. Before we go, I do want to, uh, to share a quotation with everyone that perhaps some of you have already seen. It's from a letter that was written by a New York superintendent recently. And I think it's really important because we have all been, of course, talking about things philosophically, theoretically, and using data. But it's important for us to remember that teachers are people and the students are people, they are individuals. So this is part of what was in that letter. I quote, when the children return to school, they will have returned with a new history that we need to help them identify and make sense of. When the children return to school, we'll need to listen to them, let their stories be told. They've endured a year that has no parallel in modern times. There is no assessment that applies to who they are or what they have learned. Remember, their brains did not go into hibernation during this year. Their brains may not have been focused on traditional school material, but they did not stop either. Their brains may have been focused on where their next meal is coming from or how to care for a younger sibling or how to deal with missing grandma or how it feels to surrender a beloved pet or how to deal with death. Our job is to welcome them back and help them write that history. I would say that that is the same for our teachers too. And with that, are there any further comments or questions from the board? Hearing none, I will adjourn this meeting and I'll see you all again on January 12th at 6.30 for the public meeting. Stay safe, wear your masks <laughs> and have a good evening. <laughs>